this one is actually yeah I had the um, I had a first volume that was uh, titled the uh, elementary prophetic ministry this is the second volume now in the series I believe there will be three of them all right I already have the third one in mind uh, but this is now volume number two and this one I titled it the uh, healthy prophetic ministry you know basically the first uh, volume of that series uh, was all about explaining and breaking down all the fundamentals and basics of how to prophesy, you know, regardless of uh, how experienced or knowledgeable or not you are in the prophetic and with the spiritual gifts. The idea was really to be able to train and equip individuals um, of all walks of life and all levels on how to, how to hear from the Lord how to understand and navigate and, and grow in the spiritual gifts, understand what the, prof, the prophetic is all about, you know. And um, for those who don't know anything about it, that first volume was really ideal, you know, to get started with that. And for those who already experienced in the prophetic, it was also a great way to, for them to come back to the basics and fundamentals that we so easily forget, right? So that was uh, volume number one. Now, uh, I, I didn't want to stop here right I, I didn't want to stop there I wanted to keep going more in depth and this is why I wrote this volume here the healthy prophetic ministry uh, this one is not so much on how to hear you know directly from the Lord how to hear the voice of God for myself how to prophesy it's not really the aim of that book uh, actually my intent was more uh, to, uh, to explain what it is to be a healthy prophetic person That's always my my goal um, I want to write books that are easy to understand I want them to be accessible to even the five years old of course some topics will be <laughs> more complex than just you know what a five years old can grasp but definitely I want anybody uh, to be able to understand what I'm talking about um, and even when I talk about very very deep topics you know I can I can talk about different things that are really uh, deep things in the kingdom of God, deep spiritual matters uh, or concepts, and um, but I want to break them down in a way that uh, you know anybody can understand. That's always been my my goal and my aim. The reason why is because I have such a passion for everybody, you know, to be able to access those things. You know, it's, it's it makes me think of the movie uh, Ratatouille. You know, mm -hmm. and and uh, for those who have seen that movie, there's this motto that the, the chef who passed away used to have and anyone can cook right anyone can cook and of course it's the story of this rat remy um in the movie that that really um uh, is is a chef is a is a uh, you know prodigy of of gastronomy and so basically you know it's just kind of like um the idea behind the way i want to write my books i do believe that anyone can cook Correct. Correct. So um, the very first book that I wrote actually was about healing. I have a passion for the healing ministry and it was back in 2013. Uh, it's been 11 years now exactly that I wrote that book. Um, and of course, back in the days, it was in, in, in French language, which is my, my primary language. Um, and later on, you know, maybe 10 years later or something like that, or, or maybe nine years uh nine years later i i actually uh published that book in english language um with a simplified version though it was not exactly the original uh the same copy as the french original but it was a simplified um version of that book in english language for everybody to access uh and then my second book was you know the first volume of this series about the prophetic this time um, and of course, because it's, it's just, it makes sense, right? I, I used to write in my own primary language, uh, where I'm very comfortable. This is the language that I've always used all my life. So it makes sense for me to write in French. Now, why did I write this one in English this time? Not, not in French first. Um, I really felt that deep in my spirit to, to write in English this time. Number one, I believe that I have become more fluent with 
English language, you know, um, not that I have a perfect English, but I believe I'm more fluent and more comfortable with not only speaking that language, but also writing that language. Uh, so there's that. And number two, I believe I had a grace from the Holy Spirit to actually do so because, you know, it's, it's, it's writing and writing properly is, is more of a challenge. Uh, writing a book you know, you really have to be um, not only fluent, but you have to be really well articulate uh, with the language that you're, you're using. And especially when you want to talk about things of the kingdom, spiritual matters, you really have to be articulate and in, in in, in, in good with your grammar, <laughs> you know. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge maybe, but I felt the grace from the Holy Spirit to do so. And I believe, you know, I achieved it a little bit. Um, and, 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 and really the main reason why I wrote in English is I felt deep down in my heart that I, I needed to write in English. The reason why is because each language uh, carries their own power and anointing. Um, I believe that, you know, French language is really good for anything that has to do with philosophy, uh, intellectual concepts you know, anything that has to do with reasoning. We have a lot of vocabulary, a lot of words for different concepts. And, and French language is really, really built upon that, actually. Every language has a story, right? And the French language has a story of philosophy, of, of, of thinking, of uh, all of those things, and also of romance and, and love language. Uh, so when it comes to those things, where, whether it's, it's articulating uh, some deep intellectual concept or um, you know, any type of, of love, romantic language, then I would go for the French. When it comes to spiritual matters, I believe there's something very special that, that the English language carries. The English language has a different history than, than the French language. Um, and also the people that speak that language have a different history mm -hmm. and story. They carry something different. I do, I do believe that language is not just... Um, a set of words, you know, it's also uh, a, an entity, if you will, that is attached to the people that speak it. So the, the story and the history of the language is attached, deeply tied to the history and the mindset of the people that speak it. Mm -hmm. um, because actually the language evolves as we create it. Mm -hmm. So language comes from, from our views uh, our way of seeing the world. Uh, a language carries a worldview. A language carries uh, some type of anointing, some type of grace, some type of mindset, uh, depending on who is creating it over time. So language evolves and, 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 and changes and grows alongside the people that actually uh, create it over time and modify it over time generation after generation. So English really has something that is deeply spiritual to me. It's very spiritual, you know. So for me, I find that um, between French and English, when I want to express spiritual things, I naturally lean towards the English language. Mm -hmm. Even in my prayer life now, in my worship time, uh, although French is my primary language, Believe it or not, but I actually speak to God in English now, most of the time. I still use the French, but I find that the English language helps me um, dive more into uh, spiritual things and also have a, a more fluent, more fluid relationship with the Lord. Um, so yeah, that is definitely the, uh, the main topic of this book. You know, I don't think that we can be a good prophetic person or ministry, uh, if we don't function well with community. So what is community? Um, it's the others really. And I talk about that in my first chapter, actually, I talk about the others, you know, um, and how it's, it's deeply tied to, uh, the very existence of the prophetic, by the way, because there would be no prophetic if there was no others, you know, because if God was alone, he would not need the prophetic. <laughs> I mean, God is prophetic by nature, right? <laughs> but he would not need uh, the prophetic to be a thing. Uh, the prophetic is really 
hearing from the Lord in, in our natural sphere, right? That's what we call the prophetic. The prophetic is really any message, any word, any intent that we hear from God, that we receive from the Lord, from the spiritual uh, world into the natural and physical world. That's what we call the prophetic in, in very simple terms. And so the reason why we need or experience the prophetic is because somebody is here, somebody exists to hear God's voice. So first, God had to create the others. Mm -hmm. He had to create beings, the human being. He had to create us. And, uh, and, and that's why the prophetic is, is a thing. <laughs> you know, so um, why do we need the prophetic is because, well, we need to hear the voice of God. And, um, and, and we, we, we need the others for that, you know, we need the others. So really the existence of the prophetic is deeply tied to the very existence of, of other beings. And, and that's what I call a community. And we cannot, we cannot be close to God without being close to community. I think it's, it's very important to understand that, uh, that God said, you know, it's very good. Everything that I created is awesome. It's very good. It's good. It's good. It's good. And the first time that God says it's not good, it's when he goes, it's not good for the man to be alone. And so he gave uh, a companion to the man. He gave an author, the first author to Adam for him to enjoy community and to create the first family. And, uh, and that's where prophecy kicks in. By the way, the very first prophecy that you see in the word of God happens right after the other is being introduced. Because when Eve is being introduced to Adam, so the other community kicks into the life of Adam, Adam is just like exclaiming himself now. And he goes, now this is the flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. She will be called this and that. It's like he starts prophesying. It's the very first prophecy. He's prophesying over this other being that now she's going to be his mate, his soulmate, his wife, and that she's going to be the mother of all, of all the, the human beings. That is prophecy. So the very first prophecy given by a man in the entire word of God was given by Adam, and it happened when he was introduced to community. And so it's important for us to understand that, that there's no prophetic ministry without community. It's, it, it cannot be. You cannot separate the prophetic from community. So we have to understand that and we have to function well as community, which is a challenge because now we have to uh, endure the others. We have to accept, we have to love, we have to forgive, we have to relate, we have to, to, to grow with them. We have to, you know, iron sharpens iron. So we have to endure all of those things through community. And it's one of the main challenges of prophetic people. Prophetic people by nature don't really like community so much they like to be lone wolves and lone rangers because that's how they, they they thrive better by nature you know so they have to learn how to grow in wisdom and and being healthy by submitting themselves to the need their need for community it's pride it's, it's pride, you know, it's pride because ultimately we need community and that means that we need to submit ourselves to uh, the importance and the value of others around us and above us, you know, um, and, and we need to accept the fact that we need to grow. You know, the way we are introduced in this world is we, we start as babies and so a baby is dependent upon a parent to grow, to be fed, to be covered, uh, all of the above, and then to be trained and, and, and taught, you know. Uh, nobody, nobody as, at the age of three has been um, self-teaching, you know, how to read, uh, how to write. That, that doesn't happen. It's just not a thing. So we need others to train us, to teach us, to correct us. And, and God has given us the model of, of a parent, a family, which is the very core and the very first unit of community for us to understand how it works. Now that is true uh, when it comes to ministry. Uh, accountability really is uh, our best friend. You know, um, accountability means that, hey, I give permission to someone 
who is safe and, and trustworthy uh, and appointed for that, but I give permission to others to have an input and an insight in my life to give me feedback and even correct me if necessary. That is accountability. I do understand that, you know, as we say, with great power comes great responsibility. If I have a gift and I am not in a position where I can speak from the Lord to someone, I'd better get it right. Or at least I, I'd better treat those people with love, you know, because I do have the responsibility to represent God well and to not do whatever, right? So um, with the prophetic ministry, there's a huge need for accountability. And it's one of the main things where, you know, a lot of prophetic people, even that they have a genuine call, a genuine gift, but they struggle with that. Um, but that's that's the whole point of my book. <laughs> It's the whole point of my book. That's the reason why I wrote that book is because we need to understand that if we are to grow as a prophetic people, then we need to submit ourselves to accountability because it's going to protect us. At the end of the day, it's going to cover us. It's going to protect us from going astray, from being uh, prideful, from, from you know stumbling and, and falling into different pits and, 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 and downfalls. Correct. That's what it's all about. It's all about. And we need to understand that it's the very nature of the prophetic. God speaks to us directly, yes, but He also speaks to us through the others. And so that means that even the most prophetic person in the world has to accept that and submit themselves to that. You know, um, one of the reasons why highly prophetic people struggle with accountability sometimes is because. Uh, you know, they can be more gifted than the very people that have a authority over them. Now, what, how do you do, how do you carry yourself when you have to submit to an authority coming from someone who is a lot less prophetic than you are, right? And, and somehow you can be, that's where pride kicks in because you can be like, hey, I hear God a lot more than, than, than this person. You know, I'm more powerful and my, my gifts are more spectacular. You know, and that's where humility becomes really a thing in your life. Right. Uh, I talk about that, I believe, in my second chapter. You know, who is my community? Who is my community, yes. And um, I believe it's both. I believe it's God who already knows who your community is meant to be and I believe that we are to also choose our community uh, but choosing according to God's choice you know uh, I didn't get to choose what family I would be born in I didn't choose my parents nobody did you know so um, I have to trust the, the choice of the Lord I have to trust the fact that God knew what he was doing when he had me born in that family with those parents in that context, in that time in history, in that place of the world. Uh, so God chose my first initial community. You know, family, our family is our first community. So God chose that for me, but then I still have to choose my family. I choose to love them. Um, and when it comes to a congregation, local church, it's the same. I do believe that God is the one who knows exactly where we belong. And he wants to lead us where we belong, right? But also, it's going to take some personal decision um, and acceptation and love. And we have to choose our people. So I talk about the example of Ruth in that mm -hmm. chapter, you know, and how this uh, precious woman, you know, she was a Moabite. She was not even part of Israel. But she's talked to Naomi and she said, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. It's a powerful choice that I believe we all have to make. If we are to actually thrive with whichever community we're, we're called to belong to. My profound belief is that a prophet um, is the message. Their life is the message from the Lord. They may prophesy uh, more or less. They may not even prophesy, 
uh, I had this mentor that used to, to, to teach me about this, the fact that some prophets, you will never hear them prophesy at all. They will never give a prophetic word in public, but they are prophets. So how is that possible? Because we expect the prophets to just like speak from the Lord and announce the future and this and that, you know, and it's true. Um, but there are different kinds of prophets, the same way there are different kinds of eagles. There are prophets for different spheres of, of, of life and of society. Um, there are prophets for business, the business realm. There are prophets for church. There are prophets for different other uh, areas. There are prophets for, for uh, you know, international matters. There are prophets for local matters. Um, but ultimately, they are the message. They are the, the, the prophecy. They, they, they can prophesy and they will most often, but they are the prophecy. What does that mean? It means that their life is the prophecy. What happens to them is no accident, no coincidence. Does that mean that everything is always according to the will of God? No, I believe there are mistakes, you know, along the way. But I also believe that God is a specialist uh, when it comes to turning a plan B, C, D, E, Z into a plan A. He's a specialist at that. And so I think that people are shaped by even the, 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 the mistakes and even the, the, the trials that they go through. Even the consequences of their own bad choices, right? And so um, it actually becomes a part of their message, of the message that they are. And God is, is prophesying through that. Now the challenge is that those people are meant to actually be healed from that. Okay. You know, we are meant to walk in victory and dominion. Uh, we are meant to walk in good health, spiritually speaking, and that means that we cannot we cannot be the victims of our past, the victims of our situations, and 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 feed uh, a spirit of rejection, of bitterness, of unforgiveness, or uh, you know that that fantasy about the fact that every person is being persecuted. You know we have to get rid of that. We really have to grow out of that and to actually step into higher. Uh, dimensions of the prophetic so challenges and giants are a thing I actually have a, a pretty good chapter on that um, there are different different challenges you know when it comes to money when it comes to sexuality uh, when it comes to pride and power and and all the things you know that that will come your way um, but I believe that you know that's the whole point we need to understand that we cannot stay uh, unhealthy this is the main reason why I write these books. First of all, I want to train people, but also I want to reconcile the church with the prophetic ministry and I want to re reconcile the prophetic people with the church. There's a huge divide that has happened in so many uh, places because the church has been hurt by unhealthy prophetic people, genuine prophetic people, authentically gifted and called by the Lord, but toxic not ready, immature, and, um, and, and most often not accountable, right? So they've been hurting the church, and now the church has hurt them. There's been this war going on, and now you have a lot of churches that don't want to hear about the prophetic anymore. Uh, and you have a lot of wounded uh, prophetic people that don't want to have anything to do with the church anymore. And that is a problem. And that's where I write those books, because I want everybody to understand what is God's idea for the prophetic ministry, and the community, and how we are meant to be healthy. Yes. Um, so, you know, those, those two birds are very interesting, right? Uh, ducks have great qualities, and even prophetically, they can represent something that is absolutely powerful. Um, but that's going to be so annoying too, you know, uh, I live in Florida here in Miami where uh, we have those ducks that just come in, in your driveway and they poop all over the place and they invade the place, they're very invasive and, and they think that they own the place, you know, and if you drive, um, they're not even going to push themselves, they're just, they own the road. <laughs> and so it's really a, a, a way to explain that uh, this can be the exact description of prophetic people when they act out of character, um, when they are immature, 
you know, when they refuse to have any type of accountability in their life and they just rely on their giftings. They become prideful because they have a gift from the Lord. Uh, they think that they hear everything for themselves and that they know better, right? So th there's a lot of that. Plus, I believe in so many places, there's, um, there's a very low level of prophetic culture because we're satisfied with words uh, that are so not accurate, that are so not um, imprinted with the blueprint of the Lord. It's full of the flesh, you know, and so we need to grow. We really need to grow. I think it's a time for, for um, more accurate, more powerful, more anointed, and more authentic prophetic words to actually spread around. Um, that's what I want to train people. Uh, but also we need to understand that if we are going to remain unhealthy as a prophetic person, then we're not, never going to fly with the big eagles. We're not going to, we're not going to play in the big leagues. You know, a lot of people, I see, I've seen a lot of people across the continents wanting to play in the big league, but refusing any type of accountability. They refuse to receive, to receive any type of feedback. You know, how, how do you want to play in the big league? How, how do you think you're an eagle? You're not going to fly high and, and grow as an eagle if you behave like a, like a prideful duck. You know, so it's time to, to grow out of that and to actually surround ourselves with people that are eagles already. They carry that wisdom. They carry that maturity. They carry that anointing and that experience and history with the Lord. And so we can learn from them. We can grow with them, right? And... Uh, that's how we get out of the, of the, you know, duck pond mm -hmm. and we start aiming for the eagle's nest. Um, the very nature of a gift is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when the Apostle Paul says, that the gifts were given for the common good. To each and every one, the Spirit of God has given a gift for the common good. And that's what we need to understand. Common good means community, the good of the community, right? So my gifts are not for me. Uh, they are for others. They are for the good of the community. When I understand that, it keeps me from pride. You know, because then I understand that my gifts are not for me to feel like I'm a general in the army of the Lord. Not for me to feel like I got the purple star, you know, because I got a, a, a great gift. No, I'm here to serve. And with that, you know, should come the humility of the Lord Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm going to wash the feet of, of even my disciples. I'm going to serve others. I'm going to bring what the Lord has given me for them because I understand it's not for me, it's for them, it's for their good, right? So I am meant to serve. The very moment I receive a gift from the Lord, it means that I was commissioned and appointed by Him to serve others, to serve my community, right? So what does that look like? Well, it's going to be different for every person. But if I'm to serve someone, it also means that I have to submit myself. You know, it doesn't mean that every other person around me is going to have authority over me. Over me, That's another matter. But I do submit myself not only to my own need for community, but also to their needs because I understand that my gift is not for me. It's for them. Yes, um, I think that uh, overall in the church we are on a uh, wrong uh, fivefold or anti fivefold model. We are on a pastoral model rather than the apostolic model. Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 11 says that Jesus has given to his church five ministries, five people gifts you know, the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, teacher. And evangelist right so those are the five ministries that were given by the Lord Jesus to his church for the equipping of the saints for the building of his church we need to understand that the spiritual gifts when we talk when we talk about the prophetic we usually understand the spiritual gifts the exercise of spiritual gifts 
the, the spiritual gifts are gifts from the Holy Spirit to every believer, regardless of whether they're called to a specific type of ministry or not. Every believer uh, is to be given gifts by the Holy Spirit. And that is for the common good, for us to bless each other. But Jesus, now not the Holy Spirit, Jesus has also given gifts, not to every single believer, but to his church, to his body. And those gifts are people. And those people are fivefold ministers. We have an apostle, we have a prophet, we have a pastor, an evangelist, a teacher. Those are the five. And we need to rediscover those because they've been dismantled and they have been disempowered by the um, pastoral model that we're using now, where everybody is being called a pastor. The problem that I have personally with that is um, the fact that you know if you're an evangelist and you're being called a pastor you are being disempowered in the anointing that you're supposed to carry because you're going to try to fit to the understanding of what we call a pastor rather than being released into the full power of the evangelistic anointing if you're a prophet and you're being called a pastor that you, you're, you're facing the same problem and you're trying to fit in the suit that you, you it's not men designed for you Right. So it's a bit of a problem that I have here. So I, I explain, you know, three of those in my book um, because there's a, an intimate dynamic going on with uh, between apostles and prophets, but also pastors, real pastors now in the sense of like biblical pastors. Right. So if we are to function in that type of position, you know, not just in the prophetic gift, but more as a prophetic minister. Now there's a whole other well that opens in terms of responsibility uh, and challenges, you know, and dynamics, because now you have to work in interdependency with other ministers, right? Whether it's your senior leader, senior pastor, other pastors around you, um, or a, a whatever their actual ministry is, you know, you have to understand that everybody is different. Every one of those um, ministers actually carries something that is different. An apostle has a very different mindset and different anointing than a pastor. A prophet is very different from a teacher, although they carry the teaching anointing most of the time. An evangel evangelist is very different from a pastor. You know, so we have to understand how it works. And I think that, you know, for prophetic people that are called to, to uh, functioning in those, in those levels, they are faced with challenges, uh, and especially when it comes to their interaction with pastors, and vice versa, by the way. So that is something that I address in, in that chapter, yes. Kingdom culture is the culture of the kingdom of God, all right? Um, I'm French. I carry a French culture. What does that mean? It means I have a certain mindset, a certain worldview that was shaped by, you know, where I come from. It also means that I have a certain taste for food. I have a culture with food that is very different from a Peruvian person. Right? Peruvian people have great food too, but it's very different. It's not the same culture. So we all have a passion for food. Italian people, same. Uh, you know, Italian and French people share a common passion for gastronomy and wine, right? But they have a different, they have a different vision of that. And so uh, that's culture. You know, it's just uh, whether I like to have pineapple on my pizza or not. That, all of that is culture. It's not just personal taste and liking, it's also culture. And so that shapes my view of the world. It shapes everything about me in ways that are way deeper than I know. Culture decides for me in so many ways. A lot of times we think a certain way, um, and actually we do think a certain way because our culture has trained us to think that way. And I really discovered that the day I immigrated to the United States, because now the United States have a very different culture. Uh, you know, between the U.S. and Europe and France in particular, it's not the same mindset. So some of my French views were confronted by the American views. And now I get to see, you know, the best of each side, also the worst of each side, but I get to choose, hey, you know what? This is, this is now my, my mix of culture that I, I'm, I'm grasping from all of that because I understand that it shapes me in ways that are way bigger than I thought. So the culture of the kingdom is really 
uh, how can I actually think the way God thinks? How can I see the world the way He does? That's the whole challenge. We need to understand that, you know, in heaven, uh, it's not the French culture that, that prevails. It's not the American culture that prevails. It's not the, the British one. It's not the, the Mexican one. It's not the South African one. All of those cultures carry something that is beautiful because I believe they all carry a different facet of the culture of heaven. I believe they, they all talk about the beauty of the Lord and of His kingdom, but they also carry some, some flaws, you know. And so we need to understand that our culture has to submit to the culture of the kingdom of God and that our ways of thinking are not His ways of thinking. God says, my ways are are above your ways my thoughts are above your thoughts very different so we got to understand that uh, and we not we got to acknowledge it and we got to ask for the Holy Spirit to come in to enlighten us and to renew our mind like Romans 12 verse 2 says be transformed by the renewing of the mind that's all about culture <laughs>